Companeros, welcome to another edition of the Secret Letter Pointers podcast. I am Carlos Chacon, your host, and I'm here today with Mr. Kevin Fiesel. Hello. Mr. Eugene Meininger. Hey, everybody. And special guest, Mr. Edward Pollock. Hi. Welcome. Thanks for uh, for joining us today, Edward. And we have uh, an interesting conversation uh, in, in lined up here today. So the the topic is predicting application problems with database metrics. Uh, and so I'm interested to get your take here uh, on this because we're, again, we're talking about application problems. And, uh, and sometimes, you know, that dividing line can be a little thicker uh, than, than we'd like sometimes. So I'm interested to get your take and your experience on how you're helping out your application folks uh, but before we do that, so, so again, welcome and thanks for, uh, thanks for being with us. Sure. Glad to be here. But first you have so, things. Yeah, before, <laughs> first I do have some things. Okay. So, um, back, I haven't been very good the, at uh, doing the, uh, SQL server in the news, but we do have a little news today. So mainstream support for SQL server 2016 ends today. So uh, I don't know, you know, if you've already done your upgrade, then great, right? If, uh, you know, if that's on the to-do list, then perhaps that can be uh, of use to you. You're like, well, you know, uh, mainstream support ends, although it is fascinating to me how many people will, can all of a sudden get extended support uh, once they start having problems with their, uh, with their databases that are, that are no longer in mainstream support, so. Anyway, do, use that as you will. Yeah, but even with couple- mainstream support being over, you know, there's still a few years of bug fixes and uh, mm. major security issues that will still be resolved, which is good because there were a couple of surveys, I suppose, of uh, user bases and which versions of SQL Server people are using. Gary. And the the mode is definitely SQL Server 2016. Uh, that's so two separate groups of people: Steve Stedman, who we know from the podcast here, and Brent Ozar, who everybody in the world knows, um, mm-hmm. have their <clears throat> adoption charts basically for uh, utilization based off of what they've seen. And in both cases, 2016 is a good third of the market, maybe two fifths of the market. And it's not because everybody's adopted 2019. Right, right, right. Yeah, I mean, they, they, they tend to want to, you know, have to go pushing and screaming sometimes, right, uh, to, to get upgraded, so. So maybe this will be an impetus for some folks to uh, get going, realizing that 2016 was five years ago, people. Right, right. <laughs> What's always a little scary still is the folks that you see on 2016, but they're still running the compatibility levels. At like 2008. Uh, Yeah, 2008 even, right? Because unfortunately it goes that far back and you're like, oh boy, I know you did this migration, but we may have to do another migration, right? Before we actually migrate. Uh, But it will be nice to kind of get all of that kind of out of the system. this upgrade's good. The compatibility level upgrade is a lot less painful than the like brand new server or the in-place mm. upgrade your software upgrade. So it's not That's quite right. as bad. That's right. The ability to go back, right, is, uh, is a little bit easier there. Okay, well, Kevin gave a, gave, gave a couple of shout outs, but I have a couple more I'd like to give. So we want to give a shout out to Matt Gordon, uh, John Sterrett, Muhammad Sajwal, uh, Derek Thompson, our buddy Aaron Hayes, who you'll forgive me, Aaron, I rode right past you the other week and uh, and didn't have enough time to stop to say hello. I, I figured you had too much going on with 4th of July celebration, but uh, anyway, it, it would have been nice to uh, to say hi anyway. Uh, Alexi Soshin, um, Elaine Abad, Marcelo Florva- Floravanti, and Muhammad Mahadi Rahami Mohagam. Mohagdaban. As always, that last one, Carlos did not. That's like a three out of 10 on the pronunciation scale. 
<laughs> oh yikes you know so uh, maybe we gotta we gotta move to the uh let me we'll let kevin fiesel do our shout outs from now on and uh <laughs> <laughs> yes but then everybody would make fun of my mispronunciations that's that's totally different that's how it works oh you're criticizing well you're in charge from now on you have, you have a problem with this you do it you're in charge that's, that's always how I the got best to management. problem <laughs> yeah <laughs> I just goaded them until like, fine, make me a manager. See what, see what you alone. get. So thank you, Copaneros, for reaching out. Uh, even in, and please forgive us if we didn't get your name quite right. So, uh, Muhammad, we really do appreciate you uh, giving us a little shout out. So, um, okay. So with all of that being said, we want to uh, turn our our time and attention. Uh, to predicting application problems with database metrics, right? So we're, we're with Edward, and you'll forgive me, I didn't give a very good uh, intro there, Edward, right? So you've been working with databases for 20 years, right? You're up in Albany. Um, and so we'll see, the jury's still out. You're still our second favorite upstate New York person, right? Andy <laughs> Levy still, are, still, are, still holds the number one spot, but we'll see if we'll... If you can, uh, you can take him. Uh, <laughs> this I know Andy. He's been to our events. He's cool. It's all good. <laughs> um, and, and so you're up that way, and currently work for Data. Uh, did I say? I keep saying that right. It's, it's in my mind. I think you said Data. It's like Data and Data and Star Trek. It's just, don't worry about it. It's fine. <laughs> That's your like, you know, Deanna Troy's mom. It's totally cool. <laughs> Very good. And uh, so. Uh, brought to it, brought this topic to us, right? So we'll kick us off here. Now you you mentioned that you thought you know, hey, maybe sometimes this can be a little bit mundane. That's okay. Sometimes we always need uh, to. One of the things we like to do on this podcast is just to see how others do it, right? How do they uh, approach things? And inevitably, they have a different take, uh, different insight, uh, and whatnot. And uh, and so we're interested to see, see to see what you have in mind. So I guess start us start us up here, and I I obviously the you know some of the, some of the the initial database metrics I feel like we're probably familiar with right disk and CPU and you know and whatnot, but maybe take us through some of the some of what you have in mind and what what are we capturing, and uh, and then how are we going to apply it? So sure, let's first what, what what are we capturing and why are we capturing it? Sure, and you know it's easy to say some of these things are mundane at the lower level, but I think ultimately the, the conclusions you draw out of this kind of data are the things that are not mundane that make us happy. Like ultimately we're taking measurements that are very easy to get, putting them somewhere and then applying analytics to them. And so we're kind of marrying together you know, development and uh, the DBA world and analytics. And you know, things that I've got, probably gotten the most use out over the years are the simple things like row counts of tables in a database or you know, database file sizes, how big are all the files and it's the space used and allocated and how does that change over time? Because most applications will write data in somewhat predictable manners. So you can trend it over time if you're not sure and just say, hey, like how fast does data grow? Here's a 14 day, seven day, five day, whatever trending average. And you can compare to that. And if things change unexpectedly, you can begin to do things. You can measure other stuff too, like database file IO or transaction log backup size or blocking and weights. There's actually really no limits to the number of things you could track. And it'll be different depending on who you are and, and what you work with too. Sure. So let's first jump in right with the with the data storage piece, right? Because I and you know again and you mentioned a couple of different uh, options. So I guess talk to us about how you take care of uh, data storage and data data changes, right? What, what's your what's your kind of your go-to method? Okay. I mean, so I guess the goal would be, and you know, it depends on the environment. You have one database, 10 databases, 100 servers, 100 databases each or more. Um, but in every place that I have databases I care about, I would collect metrics locally on that server as often as needed. You know, in my experience, once a day is usually good for a lot of these things, sometimes hourly. If you want like file IO, maybe hourly, or for weights, you want minutely or something like that. Again, it depends on your environment. Um, but take row counts, for example. Very, very simple, very mundane. You can go to um, you know, DMDB partition stats to get row counts, kind of the, the easy estimated cheap way and grab that, put it into a table, put it back into some analytic place, a column store index table or an analytic app or whatever you want really, throw the data in and keep it and then trend it over time. 
is, is a little simpler than a row counts, but you know, they tell us a lot though. They typically change over time on tables we care about. Uh, you care about totals, you care about thresholds, you care about identifying what's normal versus abnormal. And ultimately, like when we're talking about app bugs, I guess to take a step backward, when we think about application bugs, how do we usually find out about a bug in an application? Like, how do you usually hear about it? End user contacts you and says, hey, this is broken. Bingo, it's slow, it's broken, it's not working right, there's an error, right? And you're in trouble, you gotta fix it. And it's a developer and you and an architect and a QA person having a beer, trying to figure it out and it's awesome. But like, that's too late. The bug's been discovered, it's too late and you're fixing something. And uh, I found that like, any of these metrics we talk about here, uh, they can help find these ahead of time. Like for example, let's say you build a brand new table, a log, and that log, you know, gets tons of rows thrown in every day and they're used to troubleshoot for the application and do things. And let's say they create this table and they forget to put retention on it. So it collects data forever. It's one of the first questions you ask when you create a table, right? Is how am I keep this data for uh, a week, a month, uh, a year, forever? And forever is an option, but to identify forever before saying forever because forever is like a long time. And <laughs> let's, let's say you forget though, let's say this is a very heavy log table with like lots of text in it and HTML and other stuff that can get big and it's important data, but let's say you don't need it for more than a month and everyone knows that, but you forget to put that retention in there. So you have the data going in there for a month and it keeps going in. And then eventually at some point in the future, something bad happens. Like the table gets so big that it takes too long to put more data into it. Or the table gets so big that you're running out of space in your server. And that's the point at which it's too late now. Like no one noticed it, no one thought about it, nothing bad happened. And now people are getting alerts and it's an emergency. But let's say you just monitored those row counts and said like, hey, there is hundred million rows in this table, but there should only be like one, what happened? Or there's only 10 in there, there should only be nine. At some point, your analytics can tell you there's a problem, go fix it, go find it, figure it out. And the benefit will be the analytics or whatever process you run to find the stuff will find it before the users will. And that's perfect, right? If you can find a bug before they do, you're a hero and you've solved a huge problem and made it look easy. And that's great. Yeah, so now you've uh, kind of mentioned or jumped on right tables that you're creating, or at least I feel like uh, the new tables, something like that. What's your take on it? So inevitably the, the, the scary ones, actually scary is probably not the best word, but the hairy ones, the ones that are challenging to deal with are like the third party apps, right? So I'm thinking about like my ERP systems, accounting, you know, uh, it, it, those types of things, right? So um, yeah, it's great when you, when you build it, right? And you can have some input into the process, but what, uh, what's your take on, on those other third party apps? It's worth tracking them because you don't control them. You can't fix them and somebody else will, which means the lead time between when you find something and it gets dealt with may take a while. Uh, and you might have somebody who administers a software to company, like if it's, you know, Jira or if it's, you know, team, you know, um, um, Azure was a data, team foundation server became like, you know, whatever it evolved into the Azure thing, whatever. Like there's, there's software like that out there and you might have an administrator or company that runs the software and can help you or you may just have nobody, like someone just installed it and it runs, but keeping track of it is still valuable because if you find something unusual in there, like, hey, um, this table is growing faster than ever, or it hasn't grown in a week and that's weird. This is information that whoever is responsible for that software and somebody's probably responsible in some fashion, whether an administrator or some manager or somebody, they might wanna know about it and they can probably translate that into a business thing. Like you have data, you have technical stuff that means something to you and they may or may not be technical but they'll have an understanding of how the app works and once you can connect the dots there and turn your technical details into their application know-how then you can go somewhere with it and you know vendor software is notorious for things happening you don't expect because you're not in charge of it you don't do it you know when you upgrade so you might have some hints but uh, and that's one very good use for all this too is before and after an upgrade so you have all these metrics you collect about your data you perform an upgrade what changes afterwards? Did they add tables or remove tables? Did things begin growing faster than before? Because typically data doesn't get smaller with time, it gets bigger. How much faster? Is it 10% faster? Is it 20% faster? Uh, will we need more space or not? And you can figure it out ahead of time. You know, it's kind of the capacity yeah. planning piece that happens later too, that no one talks about until it's too late. Right, yeah. <laughs> which, is, <laughs> which is never fun, right? You go and you're like, hey, we're out of disk space. And you go to the storage vendor, the storage guys, and they're like, 
Uh, we don't have any more to give you. <laughs> That's, That's what always, always happens, that. right? That's what always happens. <laughs> That's always fun conversations. Okay, so now, so now I'm curious again. So again, on the podcast, right, we like to make this as approachable as possible. So you said, hey, we can go into the, you know, the partitions, right? There's a DMV we can query. Mm -hmm. uh, but are there go-to scripts? I mean, do you have something? I know you you, you write uh, for um, for Redgate, if I remember correctly, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So do you have? Uh, are there other pieces? Um, I have written an article previously that covers a lot of queries and, and stuff, and I'd be happy to link it after this if you want. Um, because at the end of the day, you're, none of the queries here are complicated. They're not hundreds of lines of SQL. They come down to you have a 10 or 20 line query that gets some data out of a DMV, a table, whatever. And the rest of it is you put it somewhere, and then it's yours. Now you own that data, and it's yours, and you work with it. You know, database file IO is a fun one. Um, you know, you can go to that and get out how much IO occurred against your database per file. And that's useful information. And you can find out, is it get heavier or lighter during certain times? Is it getting greater over time? Because storage isn't just row counts and gigs and terabytes and all that, it's you know uh, IOPS. And if you're using more and more throughput over time and pushing more and more data, you know, from storage from over the network into your database, whatever, um, that matters too, because you eventually will have caps there as well. There's only so much data you can push off your storage at one time and get to go places before at some point your storage cries, right? No matter where it is, it could be in the cloud, it could be on premises, it can be under your desk, whatever. Like you're limited in how much storage you have and you're limited in how fast it is, how much data can go over your pipe, um, connecting your storage to everything else. So there's a lot of uh, places we can have bottlenecks and catching those early is really nice because fixing them takes a while. It goes back to the capacity planning example of like, you know, if I'm gonna run out of something. I wanna know about it ahead of time. I wanna know about it six months ahead or three months ahead. You, know, you never wanna to go to anybody and say, we're running out now because even if they have more to give you, you look kind of like an idiot because you let it go. And we've all been there and it sucks. And we've all looked at idiots before, um, but we don't want to. And we also don't want other people to suffer because of that either. We don't wanna, say like, hey, we only have two weeks of space left and it'll take a month to get more, uh-oh, and then you have a problem. And we never want that to happen. Um, so yes, I have scripts out there. I'd be happy to, to share some links afterwards um, to get all kinds of different things. And, and, and you know, again, this isn't a limit. There's always more to get. Um, you may have things that you measure in your world that are really important that I don't have listed here. That's fine. Um, that's great. Um, it's all sure. customizable, these kinds of things, and you can do a lot. So one of the pieces, it's, at least in terms of storage space, that you know, you know that I'm kind of my go-to, if you will, is actually just looking at database backup sizes, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. uh, that is a little more macro in nature, right? It doesn't get to the table level, and like, uh, I, I, and it might be interested to take a peek at some of those. But uh, if I'm looking at my sizes, that gives me a trend, at least over time. I generally have that history. Uh, it's a little bit, you know. I wouldn't say easier, but see, see, so the database is already keeping track of all that, assuming that you keep a, you know, a healthy history amount, then you can go back and take a peek and, and figure out you know, which, which databases are growing. So Backup sizes are, uh, they're pretty cool. Um, if they're compressed, it's a little bit of like a, this means this <laughs> kind of thing. But I do think right. that transaction log backups are really interesting to maintain size over time because your T log backups tell you how much has changed in your database. And I've found that if like T log <laughs> size, like sizes explode, that means a lot is changing. And I have seen databases before where the database didn't increase a bit but the transaction logs were through the roof because somebody accidentally wrote some thing that kept updating over and over and over and just setting things equal to themselves or you know, just runaway update statements or runaway delete and insert setups where like you're not really creating any more data, but you're creating a lot of churn and that churn translates into T logs. And so like the database size is extremely useful for knowing just how much data is used and you want allocated and used because the used is how much you're really using uh, which your backup size, your full backup size, your differential will give you kind of an idea of. Um, but then you also want to know about the allocated as well, because if you have a hundred, you know, a terabyte allocated and using hundred gigs, that terabyte is not going to change for a long time. But boy, you do want to know when you're getting close to that, you're going to need more and it's going to expand a whole bunch. So you do want to see that trend and know about it. But the T logs are great too. Um, they'll tell you how much change occurs during releases uh, or afterwards or there's certain times today where things are happening that don't make any sense. Um, you know, if your database, for example, is a gig and your T log is a terabyte, the first thing you're gonna probably ask is, do I have my backups configured correctly? 
am I running T log backups? Am I in a full, and this is, I've seen this happen before. And it's like one of those, like, oh, your, your database is in full recovery model and you don't have any T log backups occurring. You're just running your fulls every so often. And somehow like your T logs just keep growing and growing and growing and growing and no one notices until you're like, oh, this is going to be really crappy when I back up this T log. But like, yeah, <laughs> you want to do that. You want to like manage that and back it up all the time too. Because imagine if you like need to recover your database to a point in time and you know, you couldn't do that easily. You had to sift through like a terabyte of T logs that sounds like a job I wouldn't want to be in charge of. Yeah, no, I, I'll have to admit <laughs> at that point, I'm probably just going to uh, whack that log and, uh, you know, take the right. full, right? And I'm like, we waited this long, right? Like, you know, <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll take my chances <laughs> here. Yeah. Um, now, Andy, and all of a sudden, I can't believe I'm forgetting. So not Andy Levy. Don't, uh, don't freak out, Mr. Andy. But uh, Andy, who's now, who used to be in, Virginia, but now is in Arizona. Um, so he had something out on SQL blog, the old SQL blog before it came down. Because one of the other pieces you mentioned was, um, you know, your file IO. And ultimately, he's pulling from a, a DMV, which I don't recall at the, at the moment. Well, one of the pieces that I found interesting there is, so his script basically just pulls the, the record. You can, you you. Pull it, puts it into a table, just like you were saying, like, hey, I've, you know, this is my starting point. And then I'm going to capture it in an hour or, you know, whatever you decide, you're going to run it again. And then it just compares the two and will show you, hey, here's all the reading and writing that have happened over this time period, right? Yep. So one of the fascinating things that I find here, and I'm, I'm interested to get your take, is that inevitably, um, we'll find organizations that there's the one big database, right? So again, still in my world, a terabyte is still a big deal. And so there's the terabyte database and that's the one that everybody's concerned about because that's the accounting database or, you know, whatever. And then they'll have a number of other small databases that don't do much. <laughs> and then you'll look at those file IO numbers and you'll actually find out that one of those small databases is having an experience that you were just mentioning. Like there's a lot of churn, it's super chatty. You know, it's always, you know, ha having to go to disk or, you know, or what have you. And uh, it's causing enough, you know, contention, right? The noisy neighbor type syndrome, it's causing enough contention that uh, they're like, oh, we can just, let's just remove this. Let's get rid of this thing, right? Because it's this, you know, the, it's the big application or whatever it is, application A, is the one that we want uh, all the resources to go to. I, I, have you uh, found similar things with the, from a file stats perspective? Yeah, I mean, um, DMOS virtual file stats is probably the, the DMV they're using. And you know, you can I look at reads so. and writes, which is key. Cause like we're talk, so far we've talked a lot about writes, like, you know, writing too much, updating, inserting, deleting, T logs getting big, that kind of row counts getting huge, but like reads matter too. I've seen many databases over the years in all different places where like the database is huge. There's tons of tables and they're loaded kind of infrequently, almost like an analytics style table but they're read very heavily. And so you may not write a lot of data, um, but you're reading constantly. And so you may see very little in the world of writes, but you'll see a lot in the world of reads. And you're always interested in seeing like unusual spikes. You know, is something happening we don't expect it to? Like outside of a release or some busy period or some data load or whatever, is there stuff happening you don't expect? And if so, you know, you should look into it, figure out is the application buggy, is there a security issue? Like is somebody downloading your whole database and you don't know about it? Uh, that's definitely happened before to many, many people out there. I've read, you know, in detail, like, you know, just aftermaths of like hacks where the hackers are just copying everything out of there and no one knew about it. But it's like, that's unusual. That's a lot of reads for one hour or one minute or one second or whatever. What's going on there? And, and so, you know, this, this almost bridges its way into the security world too, because, you know, if you see very, very unusual IO or very, very unusual growth or activity, even you have to ask yourself just for a brief moment, do I think this is security related or not? Is there a problem here that's scary? And you may rule it out most of the time. And that's great. We all feel better when we rule that out, but it's a possibility. And it's always good to have that in the back of the mind as well, that it's another way this can go that can be interesting, interesting in a bad way. But if you catch it early, again, you, sure. you solve a lot of problems ahead of time and, and make your life a little better. Yeah. So I guess it's, it's fair enough. Uh, you know, so what are your, so to your point, right? It sounds like there are going to be instances where I have to involve other people, right? So I mean, it's, there's, there's a million different ways to skin this, right? But I guess, do you have any um, 
guidance, and maybe maybe your security example was was the best one. But under under what circumstances, or what are some traditional flags or metrics that you'll use to be like, hey, you know what? I'm let me go talk to the application folks about this. Um, I would say uh, you know you'll probably see it less in the size of the data and more in the I/O. I think unusual I/O. Uh, a heavy number of requests, like if your request counts are very high, if your um, blocking or weights is very high, unusually so. Uh, logins, like you can count logins, you know, something I haven't mentioned yet, but you can count the number of times people log in and log out of a server, out of an application, uh, and keep track of that. You know, what's the request count, those kinds of things. And you know, I find that knowing who to talk to is valuable and just asking you know, questions. You know, a lot of the questions here end up going to application teams like, hey, this is weird. Can you tell me about this? Or how does this work? Or is this normal? Um, but security people don't mind being asked questions. In fact, they usually invite it because they'd rather you ask some questions and have it end up being mundane and boring than have you ask, you know, than not ask the question. And then a week later discover like, oh yeah, that like weird IO I found that I kind of just wrote off and didn't feel like dealing with, um, that was a hack. And like, Again, it's an infrequent thing. Like we don't get hacked all the time. Usually somebody stops that stuff. They have ways of dealing with it, but eventually you deal with it. Eventually there's some, somebody you know, somewhere related to you, links you somehow will have some crazy ransomware thing happen. I mean, it happens to all the companies I work with all the time. They have ransomware and we talk about it. And they're like, oh, we integrate it with you. We work with you. Um, you have an API that we use. That's interesting. Oh, SolarWinds do we have? Any SolarWinds software? Like all these questions get asked and we all get frightened for a minute. We have to think about it and look into it. And, and I find that like in general, just you know, usage like this, memory usage, IO, weights, requests, logins, those are great measures that can tell us it's something unusual that could be security related. And you know, it's worth asking about at least, no harm in asking. Yeah, I think that's interesting. Um, this is a little bit of a tangent, but I was surprised to find a couple of weeks ago that Microsoft is thinking about this stuff on the OneDrive side, right? Because I started using OneDrive for all my business files and I deleted a bunch of old PowerPoint templates I didn't need anymore. And I got this email that's like, whoa, you never use this OneDrive account. And we've seen like seven, 17 deletions or however many deletions, like, is, is that you? And so it's it's interesting how ransomware has forced us to be a bit more thoughtful about tracking IO in a bunch of places. So that's that's a take on that with the SQL side I've never heard before. And it's good because you ultimately want to automate. Like everything we're talking about here, you ultimately want to automate. Like none of this we should right. do by hand unless it's something you're testing for the first time. Like, and obviously you'll get false positives in the beginning, but ultimately you want it all automated so that you have some analytics running, you have scripts running, you have some machine learning, whatever. You know, depending on how complex your data is, it might be simple. Like write a simple little query that does a little bit of comparison of data, or it could be big and complicated. Um, but whatever the process is, ultimately it should come to you and there's a problem and tell you about it. So you're not out there hunting because when you're hunting, you lose. You can never win hunting for problems. You might get lucky, but you're not going to find them all. You can't look at all the data all the time. And even if you do, it's a manual process and it's guaranteed to, to fail you eventually. It'll fail me. It'll fail anybody because we're just people and looking at data and typing. It's like going back to a filing cabinet. We can't do that anymore. We're, we're not like that. And so you don't, be, you don't be staring at graphs. You don't be staring at numbers. You want them to come to you and say, you know, Here's an alert, something happened. Here's all the information you need to look at and determine is this valid or not. And if it's valid, you do something. If it's not valid, you adjust all the algorithms a bit so you don't get that again. And then it gets a little better. Uh, and that's always the response. There's always a response to that. And the response is either let's look into it or let's make it better. And both are good. So we, you know, in we, you know, we, we've talked a little bit about you know putting that together, right? Obviously, you know you, you roll your own right through the DMVs. Uh, I guess I'm curious, right? So, uh, is this a third party? Uh, are you trying to integrate some of this logic into third party apps? Is that your your, your no your no more go to? Because um, all of a sudden, right? I mean, this, you know, I have found that um, it's easy to do the check, right? The manual check, but all of a sudden you start talking about some of that automation, it gets, it can get complicated, right? Uh, fairly quickly. So yeah, so I guess thoughts on how you, you know, is it, is it just something like, hey, compañeros, right? You need a project for the next five years, right? <laughs> Go start working on this, you know? Like, <laughs> how do you, how do you, well, thoughts around kind of speeding that up, right? I think the key is to understand your data a little bit and its complexity and, and like what is normal versus abnormal and kind of start there. Um, if you find that your data doesn't seem that complicated, um, do it yourself. 
uh, you know, what, what app you're, what apps you're comfortable with, whatever apps your teams are comfortable with, go that route. Um, but if your data is big and comfortable, maybe you don't know the app very well and how it grows and how it works, that could be a good chance to, to have a third party look at it or analyze it or get a, you know, a third party tool to do it. Um, but I always start with doing it myself. Like the first thing I want to do is look at the data myself, understand it. Do I understand it well enough to draw conclusions about it or do I not? Um, would the app team be better suited to it? If I take all this data, collect it, package it up nicely and hand it off to them, would they be better off working with it? Um, and a more DevOps scenario would make sense. They'd want that, not me. I don't want it, you want it, right? So it really depend on like the data model, the application. Um, and a lot of the work that I've done in this has been analyze it myself. You know, either do it, you know, not by hand, but automate all of the analysis that gets you the results. Um, or put it into a tool that will do that for me that I program. Um, I've not really gone to third parties to do it for me before, but that'll be to that'll be very valid if you weren't as close to your data, I think. And that would make a lot of sense because you can't, if you just pop in somewhere as a consultant and they have a big complicated app they've been programming for 30 years, you're not gonna know that data better than them and nothing you do is gonna fix that. And so the best you can do is package up these metrics the best you can, get the best results you can, you know, the best trends, and then hand it to somebody and tell them, now what? And then once they define now what, you can do something with it and, and report off of it and alert off of it and, and capacity plan off of it and whatever you need to do to, to move forward with it. It's really a knowledge problem more than anything else, I think, uh, the what do you do with the stuff. Sure. Right. And always it, it, this goes back to uh, you, you need to get along with your team. Right. You can't you can't work in an island. <laughs> yep. And they'll appreciate you for it. like th those people, anybody you work with who, you know, you're managing data for them or working with data for or whatever, like they will appreciate your doing this and helping them out because you're going to solve their problems before they know their problems. And they're going to love you for that. And, and that's a good relationship to have with people you know, anybody, developers, architects, you know, whoever you work with, you know, QA, like you're helping QA out too, you know, they're, they're trying to find bugs in software and you come to them and say, hey, look, when you press that button to test the thing and run that automation thing you did, um, this happened. And they said, oh, okay, that's interesting. I didn't know that. And so you can make a lot of friends this way and, and you know, improve a lot of, you know, business relationships and, and be more useful that way. And, and that's kind of fun, actually. Sure. Now is it, is your uh, your delivery mechanism is that ultimately Excel? Is, it, is how you're is, is how you're showing them that information? I mean, it could be if the if the results are small and simple and straightforward, it could be Excel. It could be text. I mean, there was somebody who wanted an alert via an email once who said, "Listen, like if X, Y, and Z happens, I want in an email because that email will fire off like a page or whatever to their like you know wake me up in the middle of the night system." And so uh, it would really depend on what forms of communication you already use. Um, you know, Excel is fine for like a small report of like, you know, here's some databases, here's some growth rates, but you don't really want to look at that. You really only want to see when there's a problem, right? Or when there's an impending problem or a possible problem or just something you're interested in seeing. Um, but at no point should anybody ever get all the data. Like if you're sending me all the sizes of all the databases and all the IO every day of everything, that's the flood of information nobody wants. And like, it's, you know, everybody in their career has once been asked for a spreadsheet with like 47 columns, right? Or 150 columns or whatever. And you just... You look at your look at them. You're like, what are you gonna do with this exactly? Please tell me. <laughs> like, I'm gonna figure everything out. And I'm like, really? I want I want you to show me how you do that. Because if you can do that, I, you should you should be promoted or something. Because you know, there's there's no way you're making sense out of a spreadsheet that goes with like you know, column D N or something. You just you can't. It's just too much data. <laughs> it's too much information. Something's gonna slice that apart for you first before you work with it. And that's that important automation piece in there to really like cut it down to like. This is what you need to see right now, because once there's too much of that, no one pays attention anymore. So is that the real reason you got promoted, Kevin? Is because you could figure out, you figured out you're like, I only need to send A through Z and all those AA columns, I just need to chop off. <laughs> is it that easy? Nope. nope, I got it through complaining. Lots of grousing. <laughs> uh, but that that is a really good point uh, that Ed makes there where I think that people ask for everything because they don't know where to start. And their hope is, well, if you just throw me into the lake, then I'll figure out uh, where, which rock I need. And exactly, you, you end up getting overwhelmed with this information and nothing ever comes of it because I just, I can't make valuable use of this. My brain is incapable of processing that many uh, concepts. 
especially when you're talking about over time. So now we're looking at potentially tens of millions of records of hundreds of columns. <laughs> and unless you have a specific model that you've already developed, which has some capability of uh, processing that data, turning it into some human readable insight, that's just overkill. It's not going to give you very much. And you mentioned promotion a few times, and we kind of laugh about it and joke about it, but there is a lot of value there. If you understand a business need and an application and how it works, and you can provide people with what they really want, like they say, give me this, and you say, I can give you that, but how about this? How does this look? And they say, wow, that's amazing. It's exactly what I really want. That's invaluable. That's an invaluable thing you've done. You've saved time, money. Like people forget time is money. Like time really is money. And if you cut down somebody's workload from 16 hours on a task to one hour or a half hour, that's invaluable. And you've made them happier too. And you probably made yourself happier too because they're not going to ask you for this big pile of stuff anymore. They're going to ask you for what they need. And it's going to be smaller. It's going to be more compact. It's going to be easier to create. Um, nobody likes building some giant, massive thing that is valueless, but doing it anyway and having to maintain it, that just makes you feel like <laughs> garbage, right? Like I'm making something nobody really needs, but they want it for some reason, but I'll give it to them anyway. And yeah, that feels good, right? Like no one wants to do that. Yeah, or even worse, I'm building something and maintaining something that's enormous because we think somebody might possibly have needed it or will possibly need it at some point in the future. But we've never really gotten those details because the person who uh, gave us the requirements originally left three years ago. <laughs> and, and to be fair, saving the data somewhere is okay, but you shouldn't present it to people unless they want it or need it. And then make sure like, you know, this is really what they want because everyone always asks for things, but what they ask for isn't always what they want. And if you can kind of move them to the next level of like, well, how about this? Does this make sense? Can we do this? And you get into a really great place then, and that's perfect. And ironically, I feel like we've, we've stumbled into a little bit of a professional development, you know, a, a concept in, in terms of, you know, we'll give them what they want, but I always feel like if I can solve a need for somebody, then that person, when they have another need is gonna <clears> come <throat> back and be like, well, hey, well, what about this? Now, sometimes you can, you might think of that like, oh, now I have extra work to do, but, and that, that will sometimes be the case, but sometimes that you're going to be ahead of it and, or it'll be something that you're really interested in. And it might be a way for you to get included where otherwise that wouldn't, you, you wouldn't get included. Right. And so uh, you can work on, you know, you work on some, you know, some new stuff, right. Because you're solving problems for folks. And so and, I ine inevitably figure, I inevitably feel like that's a, a good route to go. And ultimately data travels a long path. It starts with some transactional database somewhere and it flows places usually, it never stops there. It goes to, you know, to ETL processes, to reporting databases, to analytics engines. It goes all over the place. And, you know, if you can catch bad data or excessive data or some anomaly back in the beginning before it begins, you know, process through whatever sewer pipes you've built over the years to make data travel, um, that's really good because there's less effort afterwards too. You know, part of all of this work we do is to try to make sure that we can catch problems as early as possible. And if there's like 10 steps from like, you know, we have some data here to a bunch of stuff followed by we build somebody for this application, a lot happens in between. <clears throat> if you can solve problems over here, then you avoid them ever getting over here and causing a problem down the line that then requires retracing all your steps and fixing everything along the way and doing horrible, unspeakable things that make us miserable, right? Like no one likes cleaning up the, you know, and the toilet overflows of data. No one likes having to mop up the floor afterwards. You'd rather, you know, spot the problem early on. That's a small clog over there. Hey, so it's a, little, a little more water usage than usual. What's causing that? Uh, it's flowing a little slower. And like you suddenly have made an analogy from a toilet into data. That's awesome. Well, <clears throat> I'm sure I've done it before. Yeah, or something worse. You weren't the first. So I don't think you'll be the last, um, right? <laughs> nope. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> okay. Well, interesting. So uh, let's see. I guess we, so we've talked about so row counts, table counts. We've got into fi uh, files, uh, backup sizes. Okay. So in terms of, ooh, interesting. Now, I guess, so row counts, but in terms of adding and removing, do you have any, <clears throat> that was one of the things, one of the pieces that you mentioned. I mean, is that, uh, any other things to consider there or are we just going back to row counts? 
I mean, uh, row counts ultimately are you know, you're, you're adding, you're removing, you're updating, um, or not changing at all. Sometimes not changing is weird. Like if you add 10 rows a day every day to a table and they're really important, then suddenly you stop. Well, that's important. What happened? Why did you stop? Did you stop using the table? Or is something not getting there that's supposed to be getting there? <clears throat> you know, how long can that happen before you can't fix that and go back and replace it? Um, so you really, you're, it's row counts, really any of this is all about identifying trends and then determining when those trends are being broken. So you have like normal, there's normal behavior, um, and then you have abnormal behavior. And if you can define when you cross from normal into abnormal, and you can reliably report on that, or at least a little reliably, if you can be there half the time, that's probably pretty awesome. But if you can identify when things become abnormal, then that's huge. I mean, I, I like row counts because they're very simple and not enough people measure them out there. Like you have an application, you have a database, you have a hundred tables in there that all have all different amounts of data and all things happen in there. But not a lot of people go in there and check every hour, every day, how many rows are in there and then save that somewhere nice and trend it. But if you do, you'll learn a lot. And, and the cost to save that data is small. I mean, what is it like a big int, you know, per table, yeah. per unit time? You, know, you throw that into like something analytic in nature. It'll be tiny, it'll compress beautifully, it'll be tiny. You know, it won't be that much. So why not? Why not have that somewhere? And then you can look at it. <clears throat> and then you define normal versus abnormal. And the moment it's abnormal, somebody finds out and you deal with it. And that, you know, is a huge problem solved. So now, how far how far back are you normally looking, right? I mean, you said you mentioned like hour, week, month. Is that what's your what's your normal like I'm starting today, right? How long should I anticipate keeping that data? So personally, I like keeping data for as long as possible because this data can have multiple uses. Like one use is just find an anomalous trend you want to fix, you know, the normal versus abnormal, but this data can also be used for like, you know, capacity planning and for long-term trending. And so depending on what you want this data for and on your application, you may want to keep it forever or for years potentially. And again, it's, it's analytic data. It won't be huge in nature. It really won't be, but if you want to like isolate to the trending piece here, that's kind of what you're getting at is how far back do you want to trend your data to make sense of it? And that'll depend a bit in your application. Um, I found usually like a week, two weeks is probably a good trend line to go with. And then, you know, if you're within a certain amount of abnormal outside of that, then that can be a problem. You can use standard deviations or whatever statistical tricks you want along the way. I didn't want to dive into stats today really, but you know, there's millions of ways to use stats to figure out what's you know normal and not normal. Um, but typically like for just trending, a few weeks is probably what you want to go back. Um, but I would always recommend keeping data longer because you may be interested in checking and saying, well, hey, how about last month at this time? Is something interesting happened on the first of the month or the first of the quarter or the 31st of the year? Um, those are really common. You know, you have databases that run hum like machinery consistently over a period of time, but then at certain points of the week, month, quarter, year, whatever, special things happen. That one executive runs the special report you built them that they run like once every four months and a whole bunch of stuff happens. And so you may want to know how does now compare to now last year at this time or last month at this time. So I would always advocate for keeping data longer. Um, it's not going to take up a lot of storage. It won't be massive. And you may ask more questions in the future that require more data. And if you simply keep two weeks worth and throw it out, you may regret that eventually when you can't go back further. So I would always advocate keep it for longer until you're certain you won't have to go back any further. And you may not know that for a while. Uh, but again, like, you know, a bunch of ints and big ints and things like that, they won't be that big. They'll, they'll compress nicely. These aren't huge wide tables with hundreds of columns. These are simple tables with five or 10 columns at most. You know, they're straightforward, there's numbers. And so always, always keep more if you can. Um, you know, if you have trouble keeping that much data for some reason, think of ways to keep more. Where can you put it? Can you compress it more? Can you archive compress it? What can you do? There's always, always a way to make bigger data smaller. And, you know, that's not really something that's beyond us. Fair enough. Do you have a thought there, Kevin? <clears throat> Yeah, I am all about keeping data as long as possible. And that's in uh, doing predictive analytics. That is the biggest pain point that I have that anytime you talk to a team, hey, we want to do analysis on this thing. Great. How long, how far back do you have data? Well, we have the current value. <laughs> okay. Uh, the current <laughs> value isn't what it was before. And we don't know what any of the values were before. 
So and you want me to predict that it will be tomorrow, really? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Your trend from 10 a.m. today to 10 a.m. today is ooh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is rough. And you bring up a good point. Actually, I specifically had an issue arise recently where a bug was identified and the bug was actually over a year old. The bug was like a year and a half old. But because we had all the trending data from a year and a half ago, we were able to go back and confirm, like, oh yeah, that one table that grew like this just started growing like this. It wasn't anomalous, it wasn't weird, it was just a little bit more. And we were able to confirm exactly when it began and correlated everything together and said, oh yeah, like there it is, it's old, but we found it, we've pinpointed exactly when it happened, it correlates to the release, it makes sense, awesome. And it would've been a little harder with all the extra data to back it up, somebody was speculating and saying, I speculate something began happening in like March last year. Okay, um, what was it? I don't know, just something weird. Do you have any information? But with all this data, you can start pointing in and saying, okay, we found a little bit more growth at this point in time. We'll go to the table data. Oh, okay, I see a little more of this and a little more IO and it all measures together and you say, ah, there it is. Now I know what it is, where it is. You can find it in your code now and fix it, done. And that's kind of an anomalous case. It's kind of rare to say we found something from a year and a half ago, but it can happen. You know, something from three months ago or six months ago is certainly not un unusual. Like some things don't get noticed immediately and that's okay. Yeah, so uh, this this random stream listener, Andy in Rock, Andy in Rochester, right? And I, I'm not quite <laughs> sure what that is, but uh, uh, chimed in. And, and now, now we, I will say in our defense, Andy, uh, that Edward did point out using right tables, integers, right? Because he said that uh, his wife doesn't appreciate his tendency to keep data as long as possible. <laughs> Too much paper around the house, he says. So maybe time to switch to the digital, right? Digital things. Um, now, one of the other pieces that he that he uh, points out was actually in the, the scheduled jobs, scheduled job run times. So uh, keeping that information has, uh, has been able to direct development team to areas <clears throat> that need uh, performance tuning. That is a very good one. And I actually do do that and didn't even mention it here. Um, that's a great a piece of advice as well because no one ever looks at MSDB and all the stuff in there. Um, but SQL Server agent jobs, people never notice they're running long until when. Either something is broken, not running in time, or it goes over 24 hours, right? Your daily ETL job begins taking 25 hours. And you're like, why did it skip a run today? And you're like, oh, that's not good. <laughs> What's it doing? What's going on, right? So definitely, that's a very, very good point, a very good piece of information to trend over time and keep, and job failures too, um, or missed jobs. Missed jobs are something that uh, I've, I've written about before and no one ever tracks that. But when a job is missed, um, it's usually not a good thing. It means that something mm -hmm. went wrong or the last one took too long or whatever, but you won't get an alert in that. SQL Server is not gonna tell you, oh, something got missed, oops. It'll just keep humming along and you'll never know. <clears throat> if, if SQL Server agent goes down and jobs aren't executing, hopefully you have some alerts somewhere that the, uh, the service is down. But if not, you won't know that the jobs aren't executing. So, so having, having some more robust alerting on things that are missed or taking a long time is really good. That's a great one there, Andy. No wonder he's your favorite. I understand. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and uh... So yeah, that, that is a great point. I mean, so admittedly, right? So at SQL Data Partners, right? We've partnered with Century One, right? So Century One helps us with those kinds of those kinds of things. And and the re so yeah, two pieces there. So missed run times that you like as you mentioned, and other times retries, right? So a lot of times, how many times have you like you, know, you like you know the, the job fails? You're like, well, just put in a retry, right? Because it gets <laughs> deadlocked, or you know, there's some congestion. And, I'll do two uh, retries, right? Yeah, exactly. Just keep <laughs> putting in there until it's successful. And then all of a sudden you start missing jobs, right? Because they, you know, uh, they start running over each other and stuff. So it, getting getting that information, uh, you know, can can help so show some improvement. And it and it's one of those weird things. So Andy, admittedly, Andy does mention here that as you pull that together, um, you can then show an ROI there. Um, now the, the ETL, it's somewhat easier, I'll, I'll say easier, because people are waiting on it, right? Like I need my data by 6 a.m., right? And if it's not there at 6 a.m., right? Then the executives get upset because they don't have their, you know, their cubes or whatever to pull from. Uh, but this would be a smaller example of now I can show, 
hey, we're running this long, now we're running this long, and you know. Uh, you raise a great point there of uh, ROI, of uh, value, and that's huge. Um, I found that it's very, very useful. If you want to get attention from people, put a dollar value. Like if you're saving something, fixing something, optimizing something, advocating for a change, put a dollar value and say like, well, hey, if we shrink this to this, here's what that costs. Or if we reduce bandwidth from this to this, here's what we saved. And you can always put a dollar value. Everything you can put a dollar value to, it sounds you know, kind of inhuman at times and insensitive, but you can put a dollar value to anything, you know, even hours. Like I saved 20 hours in post-mortem meetings last year. Well, 20 hours times five people in a post-mortem is 100 person hours, average salary of blah, blah, blah per hour. Well, that's a whole lot of money. You can put a dollar value to anything and doing that is useful for advocating for things. And if you can't put a dollar value to it, think harder. There's always something you can monetize there. And, and that's a good way to get attention, to advocate for yourself or for others, or to just say like, I want you to do something and here's why. And the moment you put dollars to it, it's a little easier to sell than when you don't have dollars. Sure, sure. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a great point. Okay, well, I guess, uh, let's see, closing thoughts? So this has always been fun for me. I enjoy this topic because it kind of takes different areas of our world and puts them together. Like you don't usually talk about analytics and administration and development and architecture and like, you know, data science all in one session, but all these things relate here, which is kind of why I like this. Um, but I'll definitely like encourage anybody out there who, who manages data, you know, works with applications to consider trending, you know, maintaining some of this data, trending it over time and looking at it and using it to solve problems. Because like once you start doing it, it's, it'll become easy to find things earlier and earlier and, you know, predict problems before they happen. And that's, I love doing that. It feels good to me. Uh, it saved big problems. I've seen huge crises, huge outages, huge problems, like you know, just show stopping two in the morning, everyone's out of bed crying in their beer about a problem. And you can prevent all of that if you can keep an eye on this data, like so much of that can get prevented. And that's really like why this is fun because you can see those problems and cut them off here but you know that if it kept going, it would end up over there somewhere and it wouldn't be pretty. And so it's, it's a fun, it's a fun project that involves many people, many disciplines. Um, but then the day you're, you're solving problems earlier and faster and better, I guess. And so that's kind of enjoyable to me. It's a, it's a cool topic. It's a cool way to do things that, and it's a little bit outside of the realm of what we usually do, right? Like we're very used to like, we administer a thing, it breaks, you fix it, right? Somebody sure. complains, you fix it. And this is a, Let's get out ahead of that and find things before people really get mad. <clears throat> and there'll be times you'll find something and an hour later somebody complains, but you've already been on it for an hour and so or a day or a week. And so therefore it isn't as big of a deal anymore as opposed to like, did you know about this? Um, no, I didn't. How do you look when that happens, right? Not as good as opposed to like, do you know about this? Already fixing it, I'm on it. Don't worry about it. Then yeah. <laughs> it, feel, it feels better. You look a little better, life's a little better. You know, you're not distressed. Certainly the stress factor is not to be left out of this. The fact that, you know, last minute fixing and, and dealing with problems is stressful and we don't enjoy that. And you know, the less late night wake up calls I get, um, the better. The better. Amen to that. <laughs> um, and so I will put out a, 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 an unsolicited plug, right? So we've just put together a, um, it's, it's a backup history report <clears throat> is what it is, right? So you can go to simulatedfarms.com slash backup history. It's a, it, it's a um, SSRS report that you can run in management studio. We kind of talked about that at the beginning and I didn't get it in, but you know, so if you're worried about your backups and whether they're running and whatnot, it's a, it's a free report, you can, you know, it's, it's available there and gives you a little bit of, you know, color coding in terms of if we think that uh, your backup strategy is a little, it might be a little awry, so. Uh, definitely take a peek at that and, and hopefully you, you can uh, save yourself some headache. So so with that, should we do SQL Family? Sure. <laughs> Survey says, okay. So how that was a rhetorical start? question. I get it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you, can, you can say no. You can be the first person to say <clears throat> no. You know, like, not interested. <laughs> no. <laughs> this is, this is done. I'm done with this. You people, I've had enough. <laughs> Uh, uh, how did you first get started with SQL Server? 
It's a funny story, actually, and it usually is. Uh, in my case, it was a less pretty story. So, you know, way, way earlier in my career, I worked in servers and administration of hardware. And I remember being a system administrator. This is like back in the 7.0, 2000 days, so a long time ago. And, and they had a server. It was misbehaving. I didn't really know what to do. And everyone came to me, and I, I had no idea what I was doing. And so, like, I just kept thinking about it, thinking about it, couldn't figure it out, no DBA to fix it. And I'm just like, I'll just restore backup, no problem. We'll be all set. We have backups, right? So we did. We did backups. That was great. <clears throat> what I didn't do, though, was back up the database before doing the restore. And so they lost all the work they had done because apparently they only run backups like, you know, twice a week. I didn't know that. I wasn't in charge of that. Someone else did that. Who knew? And so then I did it and everything was working. And I'm like, hey, everyone, it's working. It's fixed. It's awesome. And then they're like, we're missing a lot of data. And I'm like, what are you talking about? It's working. And, you know, the end result was like, you know, they had to come back in and spend who knows how many hours putting all this data back in that got lost. And instead of being Mr. Hero, it was kind of like Mr. F'd it up. But that experience is kind of like this important experience of like, well, what just happened? How can I get better at this? Should we run backups more often? Should I understand how databases work? And that was like this little stupid sideshow clown thing that happened that kind of slowly led me into playing more and more in SQL Server, more and more in data, and eventually just saying, you know, I kind of enjoy this more than what I'm doing. Like data is interesting. Data is crazy, messy, real world, fun. I like this more. I want to get into this. And that kind of began leading me down a path from like, you know, blundering idiot to like not blundering idiot. <laughs> There's your career goal. Don't be a blundering idiot. That's your career goal to get into, right? Don't don't do that. He Impossible. cut out the blundering part. Now it's just straight flat. <laughs> it sounds less. Try to get rid of way, at least right? one of the two. <laughs> <laughs> or just be blundering, right? That's okay. It sounds yeah. all right. You're just kind of oh, you're absent-minded. Okay, I got it. <laughs> Very good. Okay, oh, where am I? Uh, what advice would you give to someone wanting to per to pursue a career similar to yours? I had to think about that a bit. And I think ultimately it's really to be curious about data. Like a lot of people, even today with so many new majors in college, like people can major in data analytics or administration and things. A lot of people still don't really start in data in their career. They kind of meander their way there from somewhere else. Like I know people that work in data that were like bartenders and now they work in data. And so they have a very interesting career path. And I feel like more than in other places, people come from all over the world to get here. And you know, ultimately all the tools you need to learn about data you know, databases, SQL Server, all these things, they're basically free and you can play. And by just being curious, asking questions, attending conferences, reading a lot, um, just goofing around, breaking stuff, you know, you can learn more. And because people's careers can move laterally very easily here, like you can very easily move from, you know, a, a career in QA to a career in data or from development to data or architecture to data. There's all these ways you can move, um, you know, in and out from like the business to data. I think people go from customer support to data because they learned all about the app and loved it. And then said, I know how this stuff works. I kind of understand the data. Can I get in there too? And, you know, you start off somewhere and you move your way through. And, and so I think you know, the demand for data professionals is so high that if you're really interested in it and you're willing to play and learn and break stuff and, and go down that road, um, there's a career there for you. And that curiosity is really what it takes more than anything else. Um, and it's fun. It is fun, I think. It, it can be scary and messy and, and heartbreaking, but it's fun. And, and I do love that part of it. Very cool. <clears throat> so probably not on the, the day that you delete data, but uh, <clears throat> what, what's one thing that can generally make you instantly uh, I'm sorry, let me, let me rephrase that. Say that again. What's one thing that can instantly make your day better? I think the simplest thing is a thank you. Uh, a lot of our jobs in tech are very results oriented. Like you have a deliverable, you deliver it and you're done. And there's more deliverables and your whole life becomes this, you have a list, a task list and you complete the tasks. And the best you do is you complete your task. The worst you do is you F it up and now you're in trouble, right? So it's like your, your bar of success is no one says anything, right? And how often do we do that? How often do we release a change or do something and the bar of success is, it's quiet. Everyone left me the hell alone. I can have a beer by the pool or something and life is good. But like <clears throat> a thank you is huge. If someone comes to you and says that data was perfect, exactly what I needed. Thank you so much. And we should do it too. Like when someone else helps you out, say thank you as well. Because again, like this is all over tech. Things are very results oriented and that genuine gratitude not time consuming. I'm not saying buy somebody a new car or something, just, you know, thank them, maybe give them a beer or something and just, you know, whatever, a slice of pizza and just say, hey, this is really huge. Thank you. Like, it costs you so little time and effort. 
and it makes somebody happy and they'll remember that in the future too and like they do something for you you do something for them or whatever and so uh <clears throat> it also gets us to not obsess over mistakes as much i find like you know there's some companies that will have a you know postmortems and a postmortem is one of two things it's a finger pointing session or it's a how do we stop it from happening again and the more it's positive and the more it's a thank you the more it's a what can we do to be productive the happier everyone is. And so I find this whole thing is really just kind of a mentality of like solving problems rather than solving people. And then just, you know, to solve the people part, just be nice. And that just, it's a slow attitude thing that is contagious and it makes everyone happier. It makes working environments better, I think. Yeah, that, that is true. I should, I should say for the record that I would be okay if Kevin and Eugene bought me a new car for allowing me, for, for allowing them to be on the podcast, but you know. <laughs> it's uh it's them and not me so it's cool <laughs> all good i've i have vote okay you have to they're like oh uh, <laughs> I, I think i missed something they say okay you've got ten thousand dollars what computer or technology would you buy yeah good question. checks in the mail <laughs> oh yes i'll buy it right now then <laughs> i trust you kevin it's all good i'll go ahead and purchase stuff right well, now carlos Hang is on. the one sending it so oh okay we'll see then um no it's all good um honestly um the one thing i've always skimped a little bit on over the years was like gaming pcs uh, i like gaming uh my, my gaming has been always split over the years between nintendo like you know the switch the the gamecube the the whatever the nintendo console was over the years i was always playing it and the pc gaming which you know is something i kind of embraced more in college and later when fast network speeds became a thing and, and gaming was more fun and you know i always when i built a pc i was always like all right i build the computer and i'll do the best bang for my buck like where can i put the most money in and get the most hardware out and feel like i did a very efficient job of building a machine and that's boring but it's efficient it's you know economic um, right. And it's effective. I get enough power. But at the end of the day, nobody really wants economic or efficient. Like if you ask anybody what they want in a gaming PC, they want, you know, high end. They want screaming fast. They want the extra 64 gigs of RAM, the video car with a little more horsepower. And so that's really where I would put a lot of it, I think. And I'm pretty sure I wouldn't even use all 10K, but I would use as much as I could and build the over top gaming PC that I would love. And, and that would be fun. <clears throat> and if I had left over 400 bucks, I'd buy the new Switch because again, Nintendo's the other half of my gaming world and you know they suck me in. I love them, they love me, they love my wallet. It's all there good. you go. You know. And you can play with your kids, right? You know. That is very, very true. Uh, both of my kids, uh, the older especially, very much into gaming now. He, you know, he's very good at reading as a new thing, which is awesome. So he can actually play games that have lots of words. And that just it's a whole different universe now of gaming that goes from like jumping around to like, hey, I can read the text in an RPG now and get better at reading because of that. And so it isn't just a video game. So it's it's pretty cool. That is cool. Definitely a shared thing there. Definitely. Minecraft's a little out of control, but it's all good. All right. <laughs> Which famous person in history would you want to spend the day with? I had to think about that one for a while, too. Um, but at the end of the day, I wanted to spend time with somebody interesting. Like, I don't want to just ask questions. I want to have a, you know, a life-changing conversation. I ended up with Mark Twain. And I really thought about him because he's a person who's very well connected. He's thoughtful. And like he had experiences and insight that went through like every field. Like I enjoy talking to like, you know, a really smart data nerd or like a really smart mathematician, a really smart somebody. But I found the conversations that I've had in my life that were the most interesting were with people that had like experiences all over the map. Like they wrote a book, they knew about, they were in politics. They like publish a science paper they have five patents like you know when people go down all those different roads and you talk to them they have a perspective that's very different and I, I appreciate that perspective a lot and I think I would enjoy that a lot and like he was a sort of person that like was way ahead of his time back then and so even 100 years later I think that talking to him would still be interesting and, and it would be fun and that's that kind of person where I want to put the time in right there very cool our last question for you today What's your favorite ice cream topping? This is where I turn into a little a teen, you know, a toddler. Um, I like lots of toppings. Like some people go to those like Froyo places. <clears throat> they have a nice little conservative bed of three strawberries, a little vanilla ice cream and a cherry on top. And they call that a Sunday. When I go to the ice cream place, like 
it's always like who's is who here mine has like cookies on top and toffee and peanut butter cups there's a mountain it weighs like five you know you know it's like always like 20 cents per pound oh when i get to the end it's like 20 dollars, and i'm like what happened why is it so expensive and like it weighs 15 pounds ed and i'm like oh god i'm gonna eat that i'm still gonna eat that thing so the answer is my favorite ice cream topping is like everything i like ice cream covered in more things my favorite flavors are the ones that have like cookies in them like the ben and jerry's crazy stuff you know like the chunky monkeys and the chubby hubbies and the crazy flavors that have like just loaded with stuff uh, that's what i like so i'm totally a child there i admit it um it's fun and my kids appreciate that too because they're like <laughs> we get ice cream and mommy's like you know how many calories are in that and i'm like cookie and you know that's just uh yeah self-incriminating right there but um yeah so uh, the answer is all of them no i like it i like it <laughs> well awesome well Edward, thanks so much for being on the program today we do appreciate it yeah Sure, this is a lot of fun. I hope it was interesting. And uh, if you have any questions or links or anything you want afterwards, feel free to let me know and I'll share everything and anything you ask for. Yes, so we, uh, I failed to mention at the beginning of the program, so we're gonna put the, you know, those scripts that you have, obviously I, ha I know where your, you know, the link is for your Red Gates the articles, but if you have those other scripts you wanna send mm -hmm. or share with us, they're online, sure thing. We'll make sure those are available. That will be at singledatapartners.com slash metrics right? Or at singulatedpartners.com slash 228 for today's episode number. Um, now, if folks want to follow up with you, uh, reach out on social media, media, how could they get a hold of you? Probably easiest way is uh, Edward Pollock, uh, at Edward Pollock on Twitter. Um, so just tweet at me and uh, I'll reply. I promise. There we go. Probably the easiest way. You know, emails can get lost, other communication methods, you know, links in me. And I may or may not notice it immediately, but Twitter, I'll catch it pretty fast. There you go. And Mr. Eugene? Yeah, you can, uh, you can find me in Omaha, Nebraska in about uh, two days. So uh, good luck with that. <laughs> Otherwise, um, I will be ignoring my Twitter at SQLGene and I'll be ignoring my email at Eugene at SQLGene.com. So best of luck. Uh, it's my job to ignore I, I social know. media. I'm sorry. Eugene. I went off on a tangent. I took your, your non sequitur. I, I apologize. It's all right. Well, you can find my social contact details. If you look at your virtual IO log file utilization on a combination of three databases, plot it over the course of a 16 month period, and then translate that into um, ancient Sumerian. And then you have to translate it back to English and that will give you my Instagram. <laughs> Oof, tough crowd yes well you know you got to keep those metrics right kevin's very committed to keeping the metrics so <laughs> <laughs> hey compañeros you can reach out to me uh on linkedin i'm at carlos el Chacon. we appreciate you uh being here today uh edward thanks again for uh for chatting with us thanks for having and me and we'll see you on the sequel trail Data Partners.